For the sake of the story, I don't recall every word of my conversations in this story. It was 15 years ago, so I will do my best to recreate them to make the story flow, based on what I do remember. I was about 19 when I was offered a job by my cousin to work for our uncle's glass business. They install giant glass windows and tall buildings and skyscrapers, not that it's too relevant to the story. The catch to the job was I had to temporarily move to Destin, Florida from Tampa. My cousin lived in Russellville, Alabama, and I wanted to go visit the family there and leave with them together to go back down to Destin. This was my first long-distance road trip and my first trip away from my immediate family. Back then, I was driving a puke green Mercury Sable, a car barely capable of getting groceries back home, but in my invincible youth, I didn't care about that. I was just so pumped to be spreading my wings and getting out into the world that the risks didn't concern me. My mom and dad tried to get me to plan and pack better, knowing the trip could have its pitfalls, but it wasn't like the trip was going to take days, and fast food exists, so I wasn't stressing out about that. I mean, I'm not stupid, I packed for the trip and stayed for a few months in Destin, but they wanted me to bring food, water, emergency supplies, etc. I declined because it wasn't the 1930s and of course there are gas stations at every exit and I had a razor flip phone. My thinking was, what could possibly happen on two busy interstates? It wasn't like I was going to some far off country with no cell service. Anyway, fast forward to the trip. I'm a Florida boy, I had no idea Alabama could get so cold, and I had no idea the heat was broken in my car. I had never used it. At first, I'm thankful because by the time I reached Alabama, I'm tired as hell, and I had made a lot more stops than I anticipated. I still had a few hours to go and the cold air was keeping me awake. Finally, I pull off of the interstate and start heading through these smaller numbered roads. The roads didn't have conventional names like an FL, they were just numbered, which I found odd. After driving on those a bit, I started being sent down gravel roads. This was the days of MapQuest, so I didn't have a GPS guiding me through just paved roads or rerouting me around roadblocks. I was starting to get hungry and thought back to my parents telling me to pack food. I should have listened. The sketchiest thing with MapQuest was that you just printed out the directions. You didn't have a map to fall back on, so going out of your way to find fast food at an exit came with the potential of legitimately getting lost. So I had passed a few signs telling me to turn off for food because I was tired and didn't want to change it. Instead, I was looking for something off the side of the road that I could easily pull in and pull back out with no fuss, and more importantly, no risk of getting lost. My prayers were answered a little down the road when I saw a beat-up old country grocery store on my right-hand side. It didn't even have a name, it just said grocery across the front of the white building. I pulled in because the light shining across the grocery sign was on, but found it odd that most of the lights inside were off. This gave me the creeps a little, but didn't stop me from going up to the door. I was starving and maybe this was a 24-hour place. I saw a shadow move across the back of the long aisles as I approached the glass door and surprisingly opened it with ease. At this point, I half expected them to be closed due to the lack of lighting inside and hoped an owner would take pity on a tired traveler and let me grab some snacks. I called out, hello? No one answered. I said something along the lines of, I saw you when I pulled up and was hoping you're still open. Again, no answer. Now this was really naive of me, but I assumed maybe the owner was older and couldn't hear me. There was a constant buzzing sound coming from the back, or maybe he was deaf, so I went further back into the store. It honestly didn't smell great inside, and I hoped they had at least some chips or something. At least those are sealed. Suddenly a man emerged from the back. I'm so sorry, we were just about to close. How can I help you? He asked with a smile. He nearly made me jump out of my skin at first, but he seemed friendly enough. Not the old man I was picturing, but actually a younger guy, maybe in his 30s. Yeah, I just came up from Florida. It's been a long drive. I was hoping you guys had something to eat for the trip. We have plenty. What are you looking for exactly? He said, without taking his eyes off of me. The guy had a weird unblinking stare that put me on edge, but what made me the most uncomfortable was his smile. He smiled big, but his eyes never moved. 
As in, the only way you could tell he was conveying an emotion was by looking at his mouth. The rest of his face stayed the same. Most people you could tell they're smiling even if their mouth was covered because you smile with your whole face. Not this guy. Just some chips, maybe a Coke? Do you have Doritos? Of course. He said, walking past me. He locked the door behind me before turning and smiling. Don't want anyone else walking in. He chuckled. Him locking the door was creepy, but I shrugged it off because the reasoning was sound, even though it felt off. Follow me. The guy said, as he walked towards the back of the store. I was young, but I should have been smart enough to know that store owners generally don't give their customers a tour of the store, but I had lived a pretty sheltered life. I could feel that something was off, but didn't want to offend by asking questions, like what's that smell? We get to the back of the store, to where those plastic flaps hang that separate the customer's side and the back end, when the man sticks his hand through, parting the plastic and says right this way. Now alarm bells are starting to go off in my head, especially as he starts looking around and past me, like someone who is selling drugs and watching out for the police. Back there? I ask and start to back up a little. That's when I notice chips beside me on the aisle. The guy noticed me and saw the chips and said, yeah, back here. We got our good stuff in the back, you can come take your pick. By this time, I find the source of the buzzing. Flies are flying over the meat section and the dim light reflecting off of the packaging lets me know that it's been sitting there a while. I'll just take this if that's all right. I say nervously as I grab a bag off the shelf next to me and start backing up towards the door. Trust me, those are no good. I have way better stuff back here. He smiles, gesturing for me to head back. I fake patting my pockets and say, oh, man. I forgot my wallet in my car. I'll be right back. As soon as the words left my lips, I spun around and did a light jog to the front, increasing with speed as I approached the door. I make it to the door and twist the lock a couple times until I hear the click. I push the door open and turn back to look at where the man is, but he's gone. I jumped into my car and sped out of the parking lot and didn't stop again until I reached my cousin's house. Growing up as a young lad, just learning to drive, my advisor told me the number one rule when entering a vehicle, check the back seat. I'm not sure if he was being genuine or if he was simply trying to spook me, but his number one rule was to always check the back seat of the vehicle you're about to drive so as to not have a murderer or some weirdo creep up on you. Now, I wish I had taken him more seriously. I had just gotten my first car, a running and well taken care of 2004 Pontiac Grand Prix. Now, my family isn't exactly one that has a lot of money, but we were able to acquire this car at a pretty decent price. At 170,000 miles, it will make for a decent starter vehicle. Growing up in Minnesota, the atmosphere was never really anything unnerving, but the winters were very harsh. This particular winter reached negative 30 degrees, it wasn't anything wonderful. I am definitely not one for snow, although I love snowboarding and snowmobiling, but I always wonder why I was born in Minnesota. Although the large cities are usually a lot worse than where I lived, the town I was in didn't fare all that well for me either. It was the end of a work week for me. As a student who just acquired their first vehicle, I was working my tail off in order to pay my parents back for the money they dropped on this car for me. I was working between 30 to 40 hours a week with school. I worked at a grocery store. This store wasn't a multi-million dollar store by any means. It was a mom and pop owned grocery store only known to the people of the town I lived in. They opened at 6 a.m. and closed at 10 p.m. I was usually working until close after I got out of school. This particular night, I didn't get out of there until around 10.45 to 11 p.m. due to a delivery truck which ran late, and I had to get products on the shelf by the end of the night. As I left the store and entered my car that night, I remember that I forgot to clock out. If I didn't clock out, I would have to go through the process of signing a sheet saying that I didn't clock out, my projected hours would be all funky, and it wasn't something I wanted to deal with. Getting out of my car and heading back towards the building, I saw some man walking around the parking lot. 
I made sure to do that fast-paced walk that everyone does when they get anxious in order to reach the front door without attracting too much attention from the strange man. Unlocking the front door, I looked back and saw that the man continued his walk across the parking lot, but he had craned his neck back in order to watch me. Every hair on my body stood on end as the feeling of horror crept over me. I watched too many horror shows at that time, and everything cast a bad feeling upon me. I unlocked the door, made my way inside, and took a few deep breaths in order to slow my heart rate. I say to myself, okay, just clock out, do your thing, and get back to your car and your golden. I ran to the back, did just as I needed to do, straightened up a few things which I had previously overlooked while doing my cleaning up for the night, and went back outside to my car. As I locked the door, I did a quick sweep of the parking lot, and the strange man was gone. Nowhere to be seen. Thank God, I didn't have to worry about him anymore. I took a quick walk to my car, opened the door, and sat down with an anxious shiver. I slid the key in the ignition, started my car, and fiddled with the radio for about a minute before switching it into reverse and looking into my rear view to make sure I wasn't going to hit anyone in this empty parking lot. What I saw in my rear view wasn't a car or a set of headlights, but instead a pair of eyes staring back at me. Never in my life have I jerked around so quickly. My heart felt like it exploded in my chest and my stomach did a 360. I threw it in park and pretty much crawled out of my car since my quick moving feet couldn't find traction. I ran about a hundred feet before turning around to see the man opening the back door of my car, taking a step out and strolling out of the parking lot. He never looked back at me, he just kept walking. I got on the phone with my parents who were asleep at the time, I ended up waking them up and told them everything. I had to explain myself a few times due to my fast anxious talking and my shivering from the crisp air. They ended up calling the cops for me and I had to re-explain myself to an annoyed looking, rather heavy set officer. They searched my car and ended up finding a needle and a twine string in my back seat. The man was a junkie. Holy shit. Never in my life had I thought I would come into contact with a tweaker in my town. I knew they existed but never had I thought one would have this much of an impact on me. I ended up selling my car due to my anxiety getting the best of me every time I entered that car from that point on. Now I will absolutely check my back seat before getting into any car. To the tweaker who wanted to hitch a ride on that cold night, let's never ever meet again, please. When I was 17, I started working at my local grocery store. About three weeks and I got transferred from the front end to produce. My first week in produce, I met all the people in my department and all was going well. One night on my second week in produce, I was closing alone when this girl came in. My back turned to her when I heard, you're new, when did you start? I turn around and we start to have a conversation while I put the last few things from my cart on the shelf. I had about 10 minutes left on my shift and was trying to go downstairs to crush my boxes, but this girl continued to talk and took no social cues that I was trying to leave. I finally get tired of listening to her talk and start to pull my cart through the produce section as she slowly follows while talking. Eventually we get to the employee's only door and I start to make my way through and she comes in right after me. I explain that unfortunately she can't come this way and she needs to just go check out as our store is closing soon. She says bye and leaves. I thought that was odd, but maybe she's just a bit weird. I crushed my boxes, went home, and didn't think about it. Two days later, I'm closing again and the same thing happens. This time she asks for my phone number. I explain that I don't have a phone at this time. She replied, okay, well, would you want to hang out when you get off? I felt kind of bad at this point, as I thought she was just a bit odd and just looking for friends. I told her maybe next time as my mom was picking me up. So, every night I worked she would come in, just pick up one grapefruit, then walk around basically acting like she was either on the phone, and then casually stop by me. It got old really quick to the point where I would hide in the hallway and watch her till she left. Eventually, other people in my store heard about her and rumors went around that she was stalking me. The deli manager explained that she and her boyfriend also had been stalked by her for a number of months. Eventually, she stopped coming by at night as I was always hiding when she did come. 
A few weeks went by and I had just gotten off work. My friends were meeting me at work to hang out after, so I headed out to the parking lot and met up with them when my stalker came out of nowhere and hugged me. She says, I haven't seen you at work in so long. I replied, oh yeah, they switched my hours so now I don't work late anymore. Well, one thing leads to another and my female friend starts to talk to her and basically invites her to hang out with us. She jumped on the opportunity, so we all started walking back to my friend's house to hang in the backyard as it was a nice summer night. The night wasn't bad, we all just hung out, and I kinda avoided the stalker while my female friend kept her entertained. The night came on pretty fast and eventually it was 1am. My friend's mom came out and told us we had to leave. Me, my two male friends, and Stalker head out and we're waiting at the bus stop that my friend needed to catch when Stalker explains that she can't go home this late and that she needed to stay over. So I begged my other friend to stay with me, which he agreed to. We wait for the bus to pick up my other friend then head to my house. Things got super weird at this point. So, basically the Stalker refused to sleep on the floor and only wanted to sleep in bed with me. I eventually gave up and said okay, while my friend slept on the floor. So I'm laying in bed, this girl then stands up, just takes her bra off, then her pants, and gets in bed with me. I at first was pretty dumbfounded and didn't know what to do, so I acted like I didn't notice, and then she started trying to kiss me and have me grope her. At this point I realized this girl had issues, ick if they were mental, or just social, but did not want to find out. I lightly push her off of me and explain I'm trying to sleep. She wouldn't take the hint and kept insisting that we cuddle. I was getting fed and eventually I woke my friend up. I say, Nathan you asleep, he sits up, no why. She then covers up with the blanket so he doesn't see her naked and then I basically explain that I wanted to go for a walk me and Nathan get up to leave the room while my stalker gets dressed so we could go for a walk. On our way out, I told Nathan to get his bike. We walk outside at this point, it's almost 3.30 a.m. Me and Nathan were walking with our bikes and the girl beside us. I'm thinking of ways we can get rid of this girl. At first, I suggested that me and Nathan just take a walk in the alley, go pee, but she says she's scared and wants to go with us. Eventually, while walking and talking, she says how she was on the track team in high school. Oh, you run track. I bet that you can't beat us to the end of the block. At this point, Nathan looks at me and smirks as he knows we're about to ditch this girl. For it to be 3.30 a.m., this girl was excited as hell to go sprinting. She takes off running for the end of the block and we take off in the opposite direction back towards my house. We rush back inside and hide our bikes in my house instead of the porch and go to the living room making sure to not turn on any lights. We sit in the living room talking about how crazy this chick is when she starts banging on my door. We stayed quiet for what seemed like two or three hours of her just banging on the door, talking to herself, banging on the door then more talking to herself. Eventually we heard the downstairs door open and we watched her leave. I lived on the second floor of an apartment building and my mom was out of town. So the next few days, I go to work and don't see her which is good. Then about a week later she comes in and she completely ignores me. She gets her random grapefruit and pretends to shop while me and a co-worker are talking. She is wearing a backpack this time and she walks right in between me and my co-worker. We were maybe six feet apart. She turned to walk away and her backpack touched something on my flat cart. She turns around and starts screaming and throws all the boxes off my cart which consisted of naked juices, some tomatoes, and a few other things I don't recall. She starts saying I grabbed her, that she wanted to talk to a manager, and so my co-worker tells me to go downstairs and just get away from the situation. I head downstairs and sit in the break room. About 10 minutes later, I'm called up to the hallway where my store manager is talking to the girl. I see from the door that she leaves and he comes in the hallway to talk to me. He says, so this girl says you grabbed her, shoved her, and that you were swearing at her. I explain what happened to the manager. He goes and finds my coworker and then comes back to me after talking to my coworker. My manager comes in and looks at me, you need to sleep with her already. We kind of chuckle and then he tells me don't worry about it, she's just crazy. 
Eventually she left me alone, but then my GF started working with me, and the girl would come in to see me and my GF, and then go to her lying to check out. She was always really rude to my GF. Eventually she stopped coming around altogether and from the looks of it, she's married to some 50-year-old man on Facebook while only being 24. Creepy stalker girl let's not meet. My parents never played music around the house, except on Saturday nights. I'd be upstairs in bed, allegedly asleep, when it would start up around midnight. I could only make out a vague, muffled beat, over which people were screaming incoherently. Come Sunday morning, I would find two empty wine glasses sitting next to the record player, in which a Beatles album always sat. The record changed each week, though help. Seemed to have been my parents' favorite, and got a heavier rotation than the others. I had no interest in the Beatles myself. My Walkman always had a cassette by somebody like New Kids on the Block or Boys to Men in it, stuff other kids my age were listening to. I had heard a bit of heavy metal from some of the older kids, and didn't care for it much, all that senseless screaming. That's what I thought the Beatles were, because that's what they sounded like to me on those Saturday nights. But on one of those nights, there was a bad storm and the power cut out as the music was playing. The red light on my alarm clock blinked off, and so did the music coming from the stereo system downstairs. But the screaming didn't stop. Not right away. It went on independently of the music for a few seconds until I heard somebody, my father, it sounded like, shout out something that sounded an awful lot like, shut up. Then everything was eerily quiet, except the wind howling outside and the patter of rain being driven against the house. I turned off my Game Boy and crept over to my bedroom door, where I stood listening. I thought that maybe I could hear some faint scuffling coming from below, but it was hard to tell for sure. I used to get scared at night, which was part of the reason I liked to stay up secretly playing Game Boy until it was a struggle to keep my eyes open. That way, I didn't have to think about vampires creeping down the hallway and peeking in on me. But standing there with my ear to the door in the total darkness, without even the background hum of electrical devices to give me comfort, I felt positively terrified. It's nothing, I tried to tell myself. Just mom and dad singing along to the record for a few seconds after it turned off. Just go to sleep. It took me a couple minutes, but I convinced myself that nothing weird was going on and started shuffling back to bed. That's when I heard a sharp, unmistakable cry, help. Somebody help. It was too much for me. I let out my own cry, mom. Dad. What's happening? From below, there were the faint sounds of things being knocked over, followed shortly by my mother's voice, barely audible, Alex. I heard distant footsteps running up a flight of stairs, but they weren't the stairs just outside my bedroom. They were further away than that. The basement? Yes, the basement. I heard that door open, and footsteps turn the corner and start up the stairs leading to the second floor. Not knowing who or what to expect, I peed in my pajamas. An instant later, my door flew open. I couldn't see who it was, and jumped into my bed, pulling the covers over my head. Alex, said my mother, breathing heavily. What are you still doing up, honey? I pulled the blanket back and peered out into the darkness. I still couldn't see anything. I couldn't sleep. What's happening? Did I hear somebody call for help? My mother gasped out a laugh. That was just your father, doing his best John Lennon impersonation. Go to sleep, sweetie. She walked over and kissed me on the forehead. I could feel the heat pouring off of her. It was like standing next to the wood stove. A moment later, I heard another set of footsteps making their way up the two flights of stairs leading to my room. When they arrived, my father entered. Everything okay in here, kiddo? He asked. Alex was just having some trouble sleeping, said my mom. But he's okay now. Right, Alex? You're going to be a good boy and go to sleep? Yes, I said. Good boy, said my father. Then my parents left me there in the darkness, soaked in my own piss, and still terrified out of my mind. In the morning, I walked past the record player on the way to the breakfast table. 
Revolver was sitting inside, not, as I had hoped, help. If it had been help, the notion that I had heard my father singing, rather than somebody actually calling out for help, would have been a lot easier to swallow. Sitting down to a plate of pancakes, I noticed that there was now a padlock on the basement door. Uh, why is the basement locked? I asked. Oh, your father was down there last night messing with the boiler and noticed that there was some mold starting to grow. That's dangerous stuff. No going down there until we can get it cleaned up, okay honey? Okay, I said, cutting a pancake into chunks with my fork. I wasn't hungry at all. I shuffled it all around while my mother busied herself at the sink. Mom? I said. Yes, honey? What happened last night? I swear I heard somebody calling for help. My mother laughed without turning around. No, no. Just your father's attempts at singing. I'm sorry if we were a little too loud and woke you up. We didn't say anything else to each other after that, including the drive to school. But as I was getting out, she said, it was just your father singing. Have a good day, sweetie. When I got home that afternoon, the padlock was off the basement door. I wondered how long it would take to clean the mold, decided I had no idea, then went up to my room to play Nintendo. After that, my parents started hiring a sitter every Saturday night and left me there with her while they went out. On that first night, I asked the sitter if we could play a Beatles record. I expected her to say something like, no, that stuff isn't appropriate for kids, but she just shrugged and put it on. That's when I learned that the Beatles weren't a heavy metal band. Maybe they had one or two songs that leaned in that direction, but nothing like the sounds I was used to hearing from below. That night, the Game Boy didn't do the trick. The vampires crept into my thoughts, and I couldn't ignore them. They were just outside my door, I knew, waiting for their moment to come in and suck my life force out. And when I pictured them, they looked just like my mother and my father. In the morning, with the sun rising up in the sky, I dismissed my fears as childish. They were my parents. They were adults. Whatever they were doing, it was adult stuff. There was all kinds of stuff that was like that, having a job, paying bills, having sex, which I imagined at the time to mean just lying on top of each other, and I didn't see the appeal. It was stuff that I didn't understand, and had no real interest in understanding. They were my parents, and they loved me. They told me so every day. I didn't like it that I was the kid and had to do what they said, but I ultimately trusted that they knew what was best, and, as fussy as I got sometimes, I accepted that. People want to know what it was like growing up with murderers. With parents who kidnapped and intermittently tortured four people, before they were caught, until there was nothing left to torture, without ever asking for any ransom, just brutality, seemingly, for the sake of brutality. I tell them it was probably pretty normal, except I thought that the Beatles were a heavy metal band. I am not a clever man. Apparently everyone knew that the blizzard was coming, everyone except me, that is. And not only did I decide to continue with my journey that night in my ramshackle old heap of a car, I also didn't tell anyone else where I was going. Or even make sure my phone was fully charged. Yeah, I'm an idiot all right. But that still doesn't make what happened any easier to deal with. So of course the car broke down in the middle of nowhere just as the blizzard was really beginning to bite, leaving me stranded on a little country road that I'd never been on before with no way of getting help and no sign of any passing cars to come to my aid. Everyone else was too sensible to be out on a night like that, a night so bleak and wild, and only two days before Christmas. I sat there for a while, cocooned in the relative warmth of my useless vehicle while the snow whirled around outside. There had already been a few significant falls over the last couple of days, but this blizzard was on another level entirely. Although the night was relatively still, the sheer volume of snow that was falling meant that the road would soon be impassable, and that if I wasn't careful, I could pretty soon be in real trouble. Even in the short time I had sat there, the snow had started to settle on the windscreen of the car, blocking out the snowbound scene beyond. The car's heater was already starting to struggle, and the longer I waited the harder it would be to trek through the snow and find some kind of shelter. 
I put on my gloves, zipped up my coat, and stole myself to venture out into the freezing night. Thankfully, the situation wasn't as bad as it could have been. I remembered passing a small cottage just before the car had given up the ghost. It couldn't have been more than half a mile or so away, which would be difficult but doable provided the weather didn't worsen. The going was hard from the outset, with the snow already thick on the road. Within a minute or two I was all but smothered by the swiftly falling flakes, which clung to me with a clammy obstinacy that no amount of brushing could free me from. By the time I could see a hazy light shining through the swarming snowflakes, I was soaked to the bone and thoroughly exhausted. My feet were like blocks of ice, and my face was numb and frozen. But the warm orange glow of the light spurred me on, giving me the boost I needed to soldier on just that little bit longer. When I finally arrived at the front gate, I could have wept with relief. The cottage was picture postcard perfect, a little bastion of comfort and warmth huddled against the glowering darkness and the vicious, penetrating cold of the blizzard. Lights blazed happily from its windows, and two snowmen even stood as silent sentinels over the barely visible garden path. But something wasn't quite right. When I got to the front door it was already open, and little flurries of snow spilled into the otherwise warm and inviting hallway. I stepped in and slammed it shut behind me. An eerie silence suddenly engulfed me, and at that moment I felt like an intruder, awkward and out of place. Hello? My voice sounded flat and lifeless in the cramped little hall. Is there anybody there? No answer came. I walked through each room of the cottage in turn, knocking gingerly on each one before poking my head in. The place was utterly deserted. It seemed as though whoever lived there had just stepped out for a moment, a fire blazed in the grate, and the dishes from their evening meal were neatly stacked in a pile by the sink. There was even a Christmas tree with an assortment of presents tucked underneath it in the living room. But there was no sign of any living soul in the place. I sat down on the very edge of the couch, almost afraid to touch anything. A log popped in the fire, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. I took a deep breath and chuckled slightly at my own nervousness. Okay, it was a strange situation, but I was out of the cold, I had a roof over my head and I wasn't likely to lose any toes to frostbite anytime soon. All I had to do was wait, the family would return eventually, the blizzard would die down, and soon everything would be right with the world again. Ten minutes passed, then twenty. The only thing that kept me company was the steady ticking of an old grandfather clock out in the hall. After perhaps an hour of waiting, I couldn't stand it any longer. I needed to do something, even if only to distract myself from the laborious passing of time. I made a quick check of the house for a phone, but there was nothing. Still, that wasn't so odd lots of people don't have a landline now that mobile phones are everywhere. I found a pen and a scrap of paper in the kitchen and wrote a quick note explaining the situation which I then pinned to the front door. I thought it best to give the family as much warning as possible on their return before they found a strange man in their home. Peering out of the window, the snow was still falling with the same languid, heavy insistence as before. The two snowmen, lumpen and misshapen under the fresh weight of snow, seemed to be craning forward and staring back in at me. I shuddered and pulled the curtains closed. It felt like I was taking advantage of the kindness of strangers as I walked through their house. There was a photograph on the mantel above the fire, two cute-looking kids, a boy and a girl of maybe seven and eight, and their father, an unsmiling, severe man who looked as though he'd seen more than his share of harsh times. No mother, but that wasn't particularly peculiar in this day and age. I told myself I was looking for some kind of clue as to their whereabouts as I crept through the cottage, but in reality I think I was just being a little nosy and wanted a peek into the lives of my unwitting hosts. The cottage itself was pristine, it looked like it must have been cleaned on a daily basis, and even the room that the kids shared was remarkably sober and neat. In fact, the only thing out of place in the whole house was a smashed plate which I found in the corner of the kitchen, which I swept up and put in the garbage. It only took two minutes, and it was the least I could do considering the hospitality I'd already helped myself to. I went back and sat on the couch again, after turning on their ancient TV set, only to find the screen as full of snow as the night sky outside. It was now well past midnight, and there was still no sign of the father and his two kids. 
I felt a little like Goldilocks as I lay down on the couch, spread my coat over myself, and settled my weary body down to sleep. I jolted awake hours later after an unsettled night. A clock radio had clicked on, sending the velvet tones of Bing Crosby S. White Christmas echoing eerily through the otherwise silent house. I felt stiff and unrest, almost as if I hadn't slept all night. I had vague memories of some awful dream, but it melted as swiftly as a snowflake under the weight of the fresh new day. My wrists hurt abominably, maybe the cold had gotten into my bones during my walk through the blizzard the night before. The house was still empty. I checked the front door, and my note was still in place. Opening the curtains, I saw that the snow was no longer falling, but it covered everything in drifts that looked at least a couple of feet deep. I wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. The rest of the day I spent in a kind of limbo, wandering idly from room to room, resisting the temptation to have a rummage through my host's possessions and try to find out more about them. It was odd, usually you can tell a lot about a family from a quick stroll through their house, but this little cottage was like a blank slate. It was all antiseptic surfaces and neatly folded bedclothes, there weren't even any kids drawings stuck to the fridge. It was a completely neutral space, devoid of any personality whatsoever. The broken plate I tidied away had been the only human touch to the whole place. The day passed slowly. I ventured outside for a time, tramping through the deep snow in an attempt to get the measure of the place now that it was light. The thick snowdrifts muffled every sound, giving the whole scene a strange sense of unreality. I felt like I was walking around on top of a giant wedding cake. There was a small shed in the corner of the garden. It looked like a rustic version of Santa's grotto swathed as it was in sagging layers of snow. The door was open, but it seemed far from welcoming. Nevertheless, I trudged towards it, eager to see what secrets it might hold. The interior was dirty and dingy, in marked contrast to the immaculate house. There were cobwebs everywhere, and the tools that hung from the walls were old and rusted. Except there was a single blank space on the tool board, a space with no dust or dirt or mess surrounding it, where some well-used tool had recently been taken. The cold drove me back indoors again, and I soon got the fire started from last night's embers. In amongst the loose papers provided for kindling, I found a sheaf of what looked like crude children's drawings. Once the fire was lit, I settled back down on the couch to examine them. One drawing in particular caught my eye. It featured a clumsy yet still recognizable rendition of the cottage, with three figures standing beside it. Two of them seemed to be standing with their hands on their hips, with large, unhappy frowns on their faces and bright blue tears streaming from their eyes, while the third, drawn much bigger, had furious red eyes and appeared to be holding what looked like a snake. Something about the drawing intrigued me, although I couldn't put my finger on it. The rest of the pictures had a childhood innocence about them, but this one disturbed me. I spent the rest of the day leafing through some old paperback westerns I found in the main bedroom, but none of them were interesting enough to really hold my attention. My mind kept returning to this strange little family and the odd, isolated life they must lead out here. Maybe it was normal for them to disappear for days at a time. Maybe it was some kind of twisted Christmas tradition. Although somehow I doubted it. Time dragged. I made another circuit of the house, just for something to do, and stoked up the fire in the evening ready for another night on the couch. I turned in early. I slept in fits and starts, probably because I wasn't dog-tired like I had been the first night. Strange sounds, muffled and distorted by the thick blanket of snow, kept me awake, and I dreamed bizarre half-nightmares of the missing children and their stem, faceless father. I rose early peering through the window to find that a thaw had set in overnight. The blanket of snow had retreated somewhat, and the bright sun edging over the horizon held the promise of further melts. Trekking back to the village would be tough going, but it was certainly doable and wouldn't take more than a couple of hours. Besides, I felt like I'd overstayed my welcome as it was, and it would be good to get out of this peculiar, limbo-like house. I wrote a short note explaining the situation and left it on the kitchen table, along with a little money think of it as an early Christmas present, I wrote and headed out the door. I cut straight across the garden between the two snowmen towards the gate. The thawing snow now had a crust of ice on top, which made a satisfying crunch with every step I took. 
I hadn't gone far when my foot caught on something under the snow, almost sending me flying. Looking down, I saw a gnarled human hand poking up from the surrounding sea of white. Instantly, I dropped to my knees in the wet snow and began to dig, raking back armfuls of ice and quickly uncovering the body beneath. I knew who it was immediately, the father of the family, his face oddly serene in death, with an ugly, bloody dent in the side of his head. He must have slipped in the snow and knocked himself out a large stone lay under his head like a pillow and the cold had done the rest. I stood for a moment over the corpse, taking in the scene in all its eerie stillness with the squat little cottage looking on. It was then that I looked at the dead man's other hand and saw what he was clutching in his stiff, white fingers. A coiled bullwhip, old and obviously well used. The child's drawing I had found leapt into my mind, and shock stole the breath from my body. I turned to the two snowmen, which were now little more than shapeless pillars of white. I bounded towards the nearest and pushed at it with desperate hands, hoping to find solid, hard-packed ice beneath my fingers. But I knew I wouldn't. The snow was light and fluffy, disintegrating even as I touched it. In a matter of moments, I had demolished the towering lump of snow to reveal what my heart already knew would be there, another body, this time that of a young girl, with her arms tied behind her back and securely fastened to a stout wooden fence post. I dropped to my knees, tears pricking my eyes. I couldn't begin to imagine what they must have suffered. Maybe they'd been relieved at first when their father had fallen, thinking that they had delayed or even escaped their punishment, with their relief turning to panic as they slowly realized their father wasn't getting up again. It was all so senseless, so pointlessly tragic. In the days since then the children have continued to haunt me. I wonder if there was anything I could have done, if the two of them were perhaps still alive in their icy tombs when I was walking through their cozy and welcoming home, utterly oblivious to their existence. I think a part of me will forever remain there, in that little wintry garden, staring at two bodies frozen in silent screams as the first few flakes of snow begin to meander downwards again out of a heavy, leaden sky. For some background, I've grown up in South Africa my entire life and live in a generally safe area. All medical professionals in South Africa have to complete a year of community service where the government places you in most likely a rural area where you are expected to work in a public facility and around the community. So being a medical professional, I moved to another province in South Africa for a year to complete my community service. I won't mention the area, but it is considered more rural than the regular South Africa city. Needless to say, not living there for very long, I wasn't always sure which hangout spots were considered safe and which I should rather avoid. Fast forward a few months into living in the new province, my boyfriend came to visit me. We drove around and noticed a huge park enclosed by a fence. There were tons of families walking around on the grass, barbecuing, sitting on benches, etc. We thought it looked pretty safe. So we chose a spot on a bench and sat down to talk. My boyfriend still lived back home so we were doing the distance thing. I was sad that he was leaving again in two days and started crying. He calmed me down and we sat looking at the people walking around. Next thing we know, there are two guys walking from about 20 meters away, straight towards us. They looked extremely sketchy. Their clothes mismatched, torn, and the typical gangster walk. We thought they might walk past us, but they literally walked straight up to us and being from South Africa, my boyfriend and I both had a bad feeling about the encounter to come. They approached us. We froze in place and instead of getting up and walking away, we just sat there. One of the gangsters, covered in gang tattoos, crouched down next to me while the other one went around to my boyfriend and stood close next to him. The idiot on my side had weird bandages or some type of white glove on his hand. They asked us if we could help them with some money because they got out of jail yesterday. We said we don't have any but they were persistent and wouldn't leave us alone. I started freaking out at this point because I've been robbed before and I knew their persistent behavior could and probably would escalate to violence. They told us that they didn't want to hurt us but just wanted money or whatever else we have to give. My boyfriend realized this too and took out his brand new phone in the hopes that they will leave us alone. They took the phone and glanced at it a few times. 
This brand is not common in South Africa, and because they couldn't recognize it, they said they didn't want the phone. They kept surrounding us and walking behind us, crouching down, which we assumed was so that the other people around us didn't see them. I tried to hide my car keys in my pocket because I was scared they'd try to take the car as they kept looking at my pockets. I didn't know what to do, so I just kept crying. I told the gangsters that we just found out my boyfriend's dad passed away and they cannot see that we are very upset. Luckily, as said before, I was already crying before they arrived so it didn't seem like a lie. The one on my boyfriend's side's demeanor immediately changed, he apologized, and gave his condolences. The other gangster crouching beside me didn't seem to care and reached into his pocket. At this point, I was very sure something bad would happen, like he would pull out a gun or a knife if we didn't leave so I grabbed my boyfriend's hand and tried to run away. They just stood there watching us and luckily didn't follow. For anyone wondering, South Africa's crime rate is very high. One of the highest in the world, and while most areas are safe, you can never escape situations like this. For anyone thinking we might have been prejudiced because they didn't actually do anything. I can promise you that when you see a South African gangster, you will know. They are also known for being cold and ruthless, so I am glad we made it out of there unharmed. I don't want to know what could have happened if we didn't get out when we did. So to those two South African gangsters fresh out of prison, I hope, I pray, let's not ever meet again. This happened six or so years ago now, when I was 16 years old. I didn't even realize how unnerving this all was until recently. When I was 15 to 16 years old, I went through a phase where I would constantly get hair extensions put in. I had a favorite salon that I always went to. The two ladies were lovely and would always compliment me on my appearance, saying stuff like, You are so pretty girl. Do you have a boyfriend? Cannot believe you are only 15, in which I felt absolutely flattered. However, after my sixth or seventh appointment, they started asking more about why I was single, if I was interested in having a boyfriend, and I would always reply with the common saying, Yes, when the right boy comes along. During an appointment, they started chatting about me being single again. This time, one of the ladies started talking about her brother. She said that he lives in Africa, but he would absolutely love me and that I should meet him one day. I asked her how old he was and she said he was in his early 20s. I was 15 at the time. Due to the age gap and the fact my older brother would have killed me for even talking to a guy in the year above me, I politely told her that I was not interested in meeting her brother, but thanks for the offer. She got visibly upset and said why. Come on, he will look after you. Let him take you back to Africa and he will make you the African queen. I just shook it off because they were always so nice and I just assumed they were joking around. I remember telling a few friends about it and having a laugh. They said I should have taken the offer. It was soon forgotten. Fast forward two years and I was around 17 years old at this point and had just gotten my driver's license. It had been a while since I had hair extensions put in, and I thought that I would treat myself to change up my look and, of course, see my old stylists for a catch-up. I went to the salon. It went smoothly. I went from short hair to long hair in a matter of two hours, and I was on my way. Before I left, one of the ladies asked if I wanted to come back tomorrow to try out their new hair oil serum for free, so I was like, yes. Nothing is free in this life. Sadly, I was like a moth to a bright light. I went in the next day, super keen for this oil because my real hair was super damaged. When I arrived there was a man in the salon too, I assumed it was their friend. I didn't think too much about it and sat down to get my free serum. The whole time this man was just staring at me, and when I say staring, I mean he was staring. He did not say a word the entire time, but just stared and did a strange giggle every time I said something. His vibes were not sitting well with me. After they finished, I just wanted to leave, so I gathered up my things, said thank you very much, good day ladies and sir. One of them stopped me on my way out and said, this is my brother I was telling you about. Let him walk you to your car. Unfortunately, my car was parked literally 10 minutes away and I did not want this stranger walking with me for 10 minutes. So, I politely declined. They kept insisting in which I kept declining. I said a no thank you. 
I do not need or want your brother to walk me to my car. Thank you for offering and for free oil buy. I left the salon and started walking, however I was not alone. The brother was walking two meters behind me, where the salon was located was practically like an alleyway, leading into a car park, leading into back streets. I turned around and told him again that I really did not need him to walk me to my car, I was very capable, but thanked him. His reply was short and to the point, he said, no I come with you, um? Huh? Okay. So I walked briskly all the way to where my car was and not a word was said, he just walked two meters behind me, sometimes he caught up, and would walk next to me. This went on for ten minutes. I felt so terribly awkward, uncomfortable, and scared as it was getting dark, and I could not see anyone else. When I was near my car, I had enough of this grown-ass man, so I turned around and said, I do not need you to follow me anymore, thank you for walking with me, my car is in this car park. Bye. He finally started talking. He said, where is your boyfriend? And me being an incredibly smart woman at age 17 said, I don't have a boyfriend. What he said and did next, I will never forget. There was an elevator right where we were standing that went to the upper level car park. He summoned the elevator which I thought was strange. When it reached us, he looked me straight in the eye and said, you need to come home with me where I will make you my African queen. He then grabbed my arm and started trying to drag me into the elevator. Obviously, I started screaming and fight mode kicked in. He was a lot stronger than me, as he was a male in his late 20s, and I was this small little 17-year-old with a fresh weave. But boy, you best believe a girl can scream. My heart was in my throat. It felt like I was in a movie, and I genuinely started bracing for assault in this elevator. An amazing gentleman who must have been in the car park somewhere heard me and ran over, which made the salon lady's brother let go of me and absolutely took off. Thank you to the kind man who saved me that day. I do not know what would have happened in that elevator. So to the salon ladies and their brother, let's never meet again and for the 100th time, thank you, but N.O., oh, I do not want to be the African queen. First, I need to give some background to be able to properly set the scene. I grew up in a small town in South Africa. The town is up in the mountains, so there's mostly dirt roads, dense bushes, and some forests. Our house was at quite the edge of the town. The road going past our house only leads to another village. It's not that important to this story in particular. An important thing to note is that there are no street lights in this town. This means that at nighttime, it would be so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your eyes. First things first. Poverty is everywhere in South Africa. I'm sad to say that most of the townspeople were white English people, barring a few families, mine included. We are white and Afrikaans. My father is the DIY and handy type, so of course we had a lot of fairly expensive tools and things. With the town being so isolated, you couldn't get everything you needed without driving about an hour and a half to the closest city. This meant that my family drove out about once a week to do our weekly grocery shopping. When we return, it's usually to a broken-in house. Usually they only stole precious cloths, blankets, pillows, and money. They left the expensive alcohol, which gave the impression that the burglars were young. The parents usually sent in the younger kids, since they could fit through the burglar bars, which we had on every single window, of course. I have many stories about this, but the one I'm focusing on right now happened when I was in grade 8, about 5 to 6 years ago. My mother, two sisters, and I had moved to said city to attend school, since my town was too small for one. Some weekends we'd visit my dad, although my parents were going through a divorce. At the time I was quite depressed, never slept at all, and spent all my time reading. I'd recently started reading a series, and I decided to see how far I could make it before I fell asleep. I had my own room on the other side of the house, the only room without burglar bars. It was only recently converted into a bedroom from my father's library and study. I felt vulnerable, so my main light was off and I was reading with only a small lamp. My window faced the road, and there was a second gate about a hundred meters away that we never used. We had a gorgeous albeit racist black Labrador, Bagheera. 
She'd sleep outside, but outside my window. She was a loving pupper and only turned aggressive whenever someone or something that didn't belong was on our property. Note, a lot of people in South Africa are afraid of black dogs since you can't see them at night. People are afraid of them almost like they are of a black cat in the United States. Here I am, reading. I've reached the fourth book and it was around 4 a.m. I'm getting to a good part when Sweet Bagheera lets out a quiet, warning buff. Paranoid and more than a little scared, I immediately switched the light off and was plunged into darkness. Everything was quiet, there was no wind that night. After a few moments, Bagheera settled down until I heard the gate being opened slowly. I'll never forget the squeaking sound as it was slowly being pushed open. Bagheera sprinted off to the intruder while I hid under my blanket. She chased him around a bit but soon ran out into the street. I lifted my head a bit as I heard the leaves outside my bedroom rustling. My heart was pounding and I was deathly afraid. Suddenly my decision to claim the bedroom so far from the rest of the family seemed stupid and immature. Bagheera? I called softly. In response someone shone a torch through my window. We both froze for a second until Bagheera came bounding back. She was a barking, growling warrior, and I could hear more than one person scuffling away. I ran out of my room into my father's room. I woke him up and told him to go look outside, please. Grumbling, he did as I asked. Bagheera immediately came inside and patrolled with him. My dad later said he heard people, but saw nothing, so he let three warning shots into the air to warn them to stay away. Ever since that night I've been afraid to sleep without burglar bars, curtains, or blinds. I plan to get a gun for self-defense as soon as I am qualified to.